uh, coming to the kingdom of God. And, you know, the greatest thing about a young person receiving Christ, they've got their whole life to live for them. And that's what makes it exciting. Tonight we want to just take a few minutes um, uh, just to, to capsule baptism. You know, what is baptism? What does it mean to us? Why should we be baptized? You know, most of how many of you, most of you remember your baptism? How many? All right. That's about, that's about every hand in here. And I dare say over the, over the years, and they're stacking up for me, you know, over the years, most of us somewhere along the way have had a little bit of doubt about our relationship with God and about our salvation. If we're honest, some of us have had a little bit of doubt or we've questioned. And uh, as, as we counsel folks, um, that happens so often. Um, a lot of things have happened. And, and you know, we want to, one, one thing is sure about baptism. There's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of confusion. And there's some disagreement. So I want us to kind of capsule that tonight and just look at a few verses and try to pull it all together so we can understand what God has, has called us to be and do in our lives. Last Wednesday night, um, Brian and I were over in the WAC um, next door. We had about 10 or 12 young people around the table, and he was talking, and I was getting information. And, and uh, you know, how many of, all of them said, I've been saved and I want to be baptized? So the question was, how many of you have been baptized before? About half the hands went up. Okay. How many of you know for sure you're saved and going to heaven? Okay, everybody's fine. Well, I'm talking to those ten around the table. Okay, how many of you know you're saved, but you just messed up along the way? And you think you need to be baptized again? And about half of them raised their hands. You know, their confusion was, because we slip and stumble once in a while, we need to be rebaptized. And, and we keep trying to say, you know, that's not the way it works. That's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Brian was trying to say to them, and, and, and I was supportive, do you know at one point in your life that you were saved and you belonged to Jesus Christ? Yes. Were you baptized in minute? Yes. Then you don't need to be rebaptized. Maybe you messed up somewhere along the way. Join the club. We raised our hand. We both have messed up. But there's forgiveness. So baptism sometimes can be a, a confusing thing. I made my telephone calls last week. You know, I had my people to call and, and to make sure that um, parents knew that their children were being baptized and, and to make sure everything was squared away. And um, we, kept, we kept getting this as we talked to, pe to these young people particularly. Well, I've been baptized before. Okay? Or... I've been saved before, okay? So, so you deal with that one. Oh, I was baptized when I was a child, okay? We deal with that one. Um, well, well what, about, what about being baptized as an infant? Okay, we deal with that question. What about if I was, I was from another church and, and we were sprinkled as an infant? Okay, that, that's another scenario. Oh, here's the big one. Well, I was baptized a long time ago. But I really didn't know what I was doing. We get that all the time. Amen? We get it all the time. I really didn't know what I was doing. And some of them, well, I've been, like I said, I've been saved three or four times. You know, what happened behind us tonight, there's nothing magic about baptism. Let me be very clear about that. There is nothing magical about baptism. But there is a miracle. And that is a changed life. That is a symbol of a changed life. That, I, I keep telling them over and over, that confirms for you what's just happened. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's a symbol for you of what's happened. But it's also a demonstration to you that I now belong to Jesus Christ. And as a family, and as a church family, we're going to hold one another accountable to live for Christ. And that simply capsules baptism. We get so many questions week after week. Well, I guess I need to be baptized again because I sinned last week. Well, golly, we'd be up here every week, Brian. We, we, we wouldn't get out of the baptismal pool. My answer to those questions were, and I, particularly to a couple of adults, and I said this. You know, if you were baptized years ago and you honestly did not have a clue what you were doing, 
You did it because your friend was doing it. You did it because it seemed like the right thing to do. And you didn't have any idea in the world. Then it's a good chance you... Yeah, right? Amen? She knows because we were talking. Then perhaps you really do need to confirm this absolutely positively. No, but you know, but you know, but you know. Once and for all. That's what I told this young lady. To someone else, I said, you know, if... You were baptized years ago, and you knew what you had had done. You accepted Jesus into your heart. You genuinely knew that you were born again. You know that Jesus lived in your life, but you just slipped and fell, and you messed up. And that's what Brian was telling the young people. Then you don't have to be rebaptized again. It really really is a a once-in-a-lifetime experience so that you confirm. That's why we like to counsel with people. That's like now on Sundays particularly, we like to go in the back. And go in a room and and sit down and talk. Make sure there's clarity. You know, I I deal with a lot of children. And I can take a 7, 8, 9, 10 year old child. Go into a room. Open the scriptures up. And I can make them say whatever I want to say. And they'll come and say, okay, I'm ready to be baptized. And then they get to be 15, 16, 17, 18. You've been there. Some of you shaking your head. I, I don't know what I did. I don't think I was really saved because I just did what the preacher told me to do. So we really try to be careful about that. And I take that child and I say, listen, honey, here it is. This is is what salvation is all about. And when when you feel God knocking at your heart and that tug in your life and you know that Jesus wants to come into your life, then you come back and, and we'll pray together and let you receive and I'll be with you to receive Christ into your to your heart. Or you can do that with your parents. So I always try with children especially to be so clear because children will do what you tell them to do most of the time in that situation. One-on-one behind a closed door with two people in but one. Not children don't always do what you want, right? That's a little humor there. Stay with me. That was my answer to those folks this week. But baptism has some confusion about it. There are people who disagree. When my wife and I got married... I had grown up in a Baptist church. There's nothing, uh, you know, we don't have the market on heaven by any means. That's where my mom and daddy took me. My wife grew up down here at Church of God. You know, church like this, when we got married. She was baptized. She was immersed. She was saved. How old were you? Eight, nine, okay. We went to, uh, we moved to Virginia after we got married. She went from a Church of God to a Baptist church. My pastor, great man, Dr. W. Landon Miller, said, Dixie, have you been saved? Yes. Were you immersed? Yes. Okay, fine. Everything's good. No problem. We, we moved to a church up near E-Town in Glendale. She moved her membership from North Mr. Baptist Church to Gilead Baptist Church. No problem. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. Had we have gone straight from here to Gilead Baptist Church, they would have asked her to be rebaptized. Because she was not baptized in Baptist water. Oh yes, absolutely. Now, I say that to say there is confusion. Had they have done that, I would have said absolutely not. My wife is saved, born again, baptized, redeemed, knows Jesus as her Savior. Amen? So, there's, you know, I, I like to try to clear up the confusion. It's not whether you're... Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or Pentecostal, it's do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You know, I'm going to get ahead of myself because I think you're going to let me preach next week, right? He lets me once in a while. I met a man in Charlotte, North Carolina last week and, you know, people always want to talk to you about church. Church, I'll tell the story again next week. You know, church, church, that's good. But do you know Jesus? That's what I'm concerned about. And I'm not concerned where you were baptized. I'm concerned, do you know Jesus? And where, did you follow God's instruction for baptism? Yeah, there's a lot of confusion about baptism. I want us to look at several passages, and that's, that's kind of the focus of what I'm going to do is, is Scripture. But this one, you're going to say, this has nothing to do with baptism. Uh, Aaron, you got me, doll? Okay. In, in John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, such a neat passage. Such a neat passage. Jesus was talking to a group of Jews who did not believe in him. They did not understand him. They did not believe him. John chapter 10, verse 22. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was in the temple walking 
in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us. Tell us plainly. You know, he had revealed himself to them. They didn't understand. They didn't want to accept. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. I told you. You know, I probably would have said, you're hard-headed. You didn't believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, I'm not a farmer by any means. Trust me. I do live on a farm, and we do have some cows. Put a whole field of cows, and they all look like Twinkies to me. But you know, those mamas know their babies. Amen? They know their sheep. They know their sheep. They do. And Jesus said, <laughs> But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. I know them and they follow me. Now what does that have to do with baptism? My friend, when you and I know Jesus and we've got him in the palm of our hand and we're in his hand, it's an eternal decision. It's not an off again, on again, back again, fin again. It's an eternal decision. Do I need to be baptized next week because I said a bad word this week? No. You need to ask God to forgive you and get back on track with him. That's the thing we, Daniel and Brian and I continually talk to young people about. Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ? I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish now that's not a suggestion my friend that's a promise they're never going to perish Jesus said I know them they know me we're together in this thing no one can snatch them out of my hand now I'm going to tell you something you might let go of God's hand from time to time but I promise you this he'll never let go of you he'll never let go of you you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty simple-minded guy. I know that's hard for you to understand. But my hand's up here, and sometimes I just let go. But his old big honking hand comes down, and he doesn't let go. He's got me. He's got me. And yes, I do thank him for that, because I am hard-headed. No one, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So for you ten who are baptized tonight, I'm going to say this was a once in a lifetime situation. Now, do I get up every morning and say, Jeez, God, help me just live my life to please Jesus. I have to. Daily, I have to die to myself and say, God, live in me today. Help me to live my life today in such a way that others will see Jesus. But I don't have to get resaved and rebaptized every week. Once it's a genuine, total commitment. Linda, are you with me? Amen. It's a heartfelt commitment. It's not something that I did to please mama because my girlfriend did it, because my boyfriend, Susie Q, did it. It's because Jesus came into my life. And you know, I always go back to the Bible, but that passage to me puts it in context. Once I belong to God, once I'm saved, it's a, perm it's a permanent, super glue, eternal relationship. It's not going to change. Amen? It's just not. You know, people say, well, why should I be baptized? And I'm going I'm to I'm repeat a little bit. But that's okay. I guess it's okay. I'm going to do it anyway. You know, why should I be baptized? Number one, to confirm my salvation. Number two, to share with you that I've been saved. Another thing is that Jesus set the example. If you look in Matthew chapter 3, let me read a couple passages. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John said, I'm not, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus says, yes, you should. Jesus came to be baptized. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And God said, this is my son. This is my boy. This is my boy. With him, I'm well pleased. And my friend, God is pleased tonight because 10 
young adults have become chi children in God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. And that, that's just the way it is. And uh, so why be baptized? Jesus set the example. And my friend, if your Lord and Savior, my Lord and Savior need to be baptized, how much more do I need to be? He set the example. You know, Brian mentioned earlier about parents, how important it is for those of us, those of you who are parents of young children, those of you maybe and I are grandparents, we set an example. Jesus set an example. And he said, do as I have do. Do as I have done. And that's important. And Jesus commanded it. And Matthew, when he says, go ye into all the world, make disciples and, and preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. If Jesus was baptized and Jesus commanded us to be baptized, that's why it's important. It's not something that your church thinks important, your mama thinks important, your pastor thinks important. It really doesn't matter. It does, but it doesn't eternally. It's what Jesus thinks important. We're commanded to do that. Paul, Paul said many of the people who heard him speak were believed and were baptized. We're commanded to be baptized. What's the meaning of baptism? Just like um, was said ten times up here. We're buried with him and we're raised with him to walk in newness of life. I always like to explain to a new, new believer. It's beautiful symbolism. It's taking that old life, putting it in the grave of the water, and rising up to be a new person. And I said this the last time I did this six months ago or whatever it was. You know, for you that were baptized tonight, you'll never forget this experience. Never. You know, I think it was October 29th, 1959, I was baptized. Something like that. I yeah. Yeah. I don't know why my mama baptized me when I was two years old. No. You'll never forget this experience. God's people have fun, don't they? I hope you're not missing the point of this, please. I want us to laugh and have fun, but I know you're serious. It, it, God commanded it, and, and, and we'll never forget it. It demonstrates that burial, that resurrection to rise and be a new person. And as, as Brian was talking earlier about this, uh, about one young lady, the folks around you know you're different because you're a new creation. You're a different person. Now, you know, the water doesn't wash anything away. It just symbolizes, I've buried that old life, and I'm going to rise to a new life in Jesus Christ. Um, we're buried with him. We share in his death, symbolically, and we rise to walk in newness of life. Um, baptism doesn't make us a believer, but it does show that we're a believer. It, it doesn't save us, but it's an inward, it's an outward symbol of an inward conversion. And I think that's where the mix-up comes as, as we talk this week. An outward symbol of an inward conversion. If there was no inward conversion years ago, but we simply went under the water and came back up, then true, it probably was a meaningless experience. But once there's a genuine, heartfelt commitment to Jesus Christ, an inward conversion, then baptism becomes an outward expression of what God has done in our life. I love that passage in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Don't miss this. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You are all sons of God, daughters of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. If you were baptized into Christ, you've clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, all of us tonight are dressed and clothed to cover ourselves. Think about the symbolism of the baptism. When you're baptized with Christ and you're raised to walk in a newness of life, you have completely covered yourself with Jesus Christ. That's an exciting thought. And, and you know, everybody around you, from sitting next to you in church to where you are in school tomorrow and the workplace, at Walmart, at the grocery store, wherever, the factory, wherever you are. You're clothed with Christ. If you were baptized, what was it, 51 years ago like I was, something, 50, whatever, I was clothed with, clothed with Christ. There's a new creation. 
People should see a difference in the way you live your life and my life every day. And that's what baptism is all about. People ask, well, why be immersed? You know, we get that question sometimes. Why be immersed? A couple things. Jesus was immersed. If I knew Greek, which I don't, the Greek word for baptism says go under the water. So that's a good reason. Um, Everybody in the New Testament was immersed. You know, immersion is just biblical, period. That's why to be immersed. Brian, I I couldn't help but think as I was working on this. um, About a year ago, he visited a gentleman in the hospital. I believe he's on his deathbed, if I'm correct. You with me? He accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. and You had the privilege to pray with him and lead him to Christ. Obviously, in the hospital, in a critical situation, there wasn't a baptismal pool to baptism, baptize him. But you did baptize him. And that was a sprinkling experience. Amen? So, you know, the baptism doesn't save us. It's the symbol of what's happened in our life. It's that inner conversion of who we are. Who should be baptized? Pretty simply, anyone and everyone that's trusted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I mean, there are no exceptions. People say, well, I'm afraid of water. We can work with that. You know, I understand that. You know, we hear all kinds of things. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. That's what Peter's words of instruction were to you and me. Um, in, in, in Acts chapter 8, But when they believed Philip, he preached the good news, the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. And it goes on in the next verse to say, Even Simon the sorcerer believed in Christ and was saved. And was baptized. Again, the example was set for you and me. These are not good ideas. This is what God's Word says. This is what God's Word says. And that's what makes it so special for me. You know, when should I be baptized? When? I mean, I'm kind of a 911 guy. I live my life in a state of emergency. I drive my wife crazy. But, you know, urgency. You know, do we have, if we're saved tonight, if we're not baptized tonight and something were to happen, does that mean we're not heaven bound? Absolutely not. But there is, there is an urgency that says, I need to do this. I need, I need to be saved. There's no magic formula on the timetable. But I want you to think quickly about three different scenarios in, in, in the New Testament. First of all, if you remember Philip and the Ethiopian, as they were on that dusty road traveling along, Philip began to explain to the Ethiopian what it meant to be saved. And the guy got excited. He said, here's water. What doth prevent me from being baptized? I'm ready. He said, he said Philip, I'm ready right now to be baptized. You know? And I thought that was such a sweet experience. Remember, Peter at the, had gone from Joppa to Caesarea to the, to the home of, of Cornelius and, and, and all the folks that were gathered in Cornelius' house. And Peter began to explain what it meant to be saved and what it meant to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then Peter said this in verse 47, Acts chapter 10. Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A third scenario. Paul and Silas, you remember the night they spent in jail? Rather than feeling sorry for themselves, they witnessed to the jailer. And the Bible says that the jailer and all of his house, all of his family, were saved and baptized that night. In the middle of the night. You know, is there an urgency? There's a necessity. Let's just put it that way, that we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. So tonight, I hope, I hope baptism is, is a little bit clearer to you. You know, if, if there was a time in your life and you said, yeah, I was, but I don't know, then let's talk about that. Let's be sure. And as we counsel folks, we want them to be sure that they know, but they know, but they know. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I can praise God for all eternity. I, I know I confirmed it in my life, and I've shown you. And together, we need to grow in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You know, tonight, there may not be an urgency to get in the baptistry, Greg, y'all can come. There may not be an urgency to get into the baptistry, although we could do it again. Amen? We could do it again tonight. But let me say this. There is an urgency that when we leave this house, we know for sure 
that Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. And I want to say tonight, perhaps the most important thing that I could share with you, if you've never trusted Christ into your life as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never invited Him in, you've never asked for forgiveness for your sins, you've never put your, your life in His hands, you've never taken a new path, become a new creation, tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. And as said so often on Sunday morning, we don't know when that last breath will come. You know, I always try to talk to folks, particularly, I, I, I mean, I know I'm an old man, but I've worked with kids most all of my life. And, you know, it's, yes, there is a hell out there, and yes, there is a heaven, and yes, there is a choice, and that's a great reason. But I always say, particularly to a young person, you need to know that God loves you. God loves you dearly. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross. That's why he gave his son for you. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And yes, he does have a home in heaven. Won't you accept him? Invite him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. You know, I always tell a young person, that's the greatest decision that you'll ever make because it's eternal. And it's once in a lifetime, God sent his son that you and I might have eternal life. Tonight, tonight, if you've never made that decision, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And I encourage you to do that. Won't you stand? We're going to sing together. Let God talk to your heart. Let God speak to you. Be sure tonight, when you walk out these doors, that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior.